First of all, a disclaimer. Uh, number one is I am not a lawyer, right? So we're going to talk about ethics and licensing. So that's the first disclaimer. And the second one, this is, as you can see, a work in progress, right? Uh, so I, I don't expect to have all of the answers. Um, and um, also, please consider this as a way of like starting a conversation. Does it work? Well, it's working there. Just it's not presenting. I don't know why. Oh, oh, yeah, wonderful. There you okay. Go. Uh, So what are we going to talk about in a, a very short amount of time now? First of all, a bit of context. I'm going to try to give a different perspective on the open source definition. Uh, we're going to look uh, very quickly at prior art um, and what's missing from it. Uh, we're going to look at the role of corporations in this whole story um, and what do we ex sort of expect to get out of uh, this ethical licensing and, and the, sort of the suggestions I'm making here. Um, if we have time, we'll look at critiques and next steps, and we'll probably answer questions in uh, the corridor. Uh, so first, a bit of context. Why are we talking about this right now? We're talking about this right now because I'm sure a lot of you started um, being involved in software and open source uh, to some degree because of the positive impact we thought it could provide to the world. Um, and we're sort of looking at the space now, and I mean, at least some of us, at least for me, and basically wondering what went wrong along the way and what we can try to do to fix this. Um, there's also, when you start to see what's uh, happening with uh, technology right now, uh, historical precedent of technology being used um, in, in horrible ways um, in the past. And this is also, uh, you know, for example, I'm thinking about punch cards used by uh, Nazi Germany to administer con concentration camps. And so... Keep going, keep going. Okay. <laughs> and so this is also um, a, uh, you know, obviously a concern. You know what? I'm just going to do it without slides, but I just will need the notes. Oh, I'm just going to take my phone. My, uh, where, did, where did my laptop go to? I'm just going to, seriously, I'm just going to take my laptop and you'll have a look at the slides afterwards. Uh, I think that's just the best option we have right now. Um, so uh, there is a desire to do something about this issue um, through, um, <laughs> this is a joke, right? Whoever cursed Toby's talk, it's not cool. I'm going to go under here. No, seriously? Seriously, you know what? Let's just close this and I'll... <laughs> yeah. No, seriously. Let's some just... of the equipment here is magical. Yeah, some of it, yeah. Magical, and uh, this HDMI cable is very magical. I can demonstrate. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to hold this here. Uh, all right, so there's been previous attempts at sort of like um, uh, bringing... Uh, so, sorry. Uh, some... Uh, there has been some attempts to um, bring these ethical concerns into licensing, um, and there's also been quite some pushback from uh, what you can call gatekeepers, um, and that's sort of normal because like their function is actually to be gatekeeping what open source is. So it, you know it's, it's sort of fair to some degree. Um, so quickly, uh, three definitions. Uh, OSI is the Open Source Initiative. It's an, a nonprofit that's responsible for certifying what is and what is not an open source license. The open source definition is a set of 10 criteria that the OSI uses to decide whether an open source, um, uh, what, sorry, whether a license is open source or not. And the four freedoms is sort of like the equivalent for free software. Um, so the first thing I want to do is sort of like consider that we could actually desacralize the open source definition, right? Um, and for that, um, a, a few data points. Well, one, it was created sort of like in a hurry 20 years ago. Uh, it was lifted from the Debian free software guidelines, and it has never been updated since, right? Um, and that's uh, in contrast to, for example, the free, uh, the, um, for freedom, uh, which uh, started at S3, right? So there's been updates there. Um, and there is, um, uh, you know, other, um, seriously, drop it. 
there's been, uh, you know, there, there's a precedence here too. For example, uh, we talk a lot about the amendments of the American Constitution and the amendments, right, it's in the name. They're like things that were added afterwards and they're making changes to their original document, right? Um, and another one that comes to mind that's closer to home is uh, that was also built in like, a, like 10 days or something is uh, JavaScript, right, ECMAScript which has also seen like lots of versions. We're now like, I think last year was version 10. Like it's, they're even numbered by the years at this point. Um, the other way of looking at the um, open source definition, in my opinion, is also to consider the privilege position that uh, its authors were in when they actually wrote about it. Right? It's a bunch of uh, white male dudes in Silicon Valley with engineering uh, sal engineer salaries, right? Um, and I think that's something to take in mind too. If uh, instead the open source definition had been uh, written by, say, people that were involved, uh, you know, whose uh, ancestors were involved in the Holocaust, or in, you know, or had any kind of different background than this one, it's probable that um, um, you know ethical criteria would have been built in from the start, and we would not be having this conversation today. Um, and I think it's fair to ask also the question as to whether uh, open source has succeeded because of the open source uh, definition or to some degree in spite of it, right? And if you look at you know, the proliferation of open source and how, peop how people actually choose software, uh, it's developers that essentially pick uh, uh, software that they want to use and sort of you know, de facto choose a license. So um, prior arts, prior art, I want to look at two different projects that um, have attempted to um, look at this. Um, the first one is uh, Douglas Crockford's um, Good and Not Evil license. Um, that was basically the MIT license with a an, an, uh, Good and Not Evil clause added to it, which read, the software shall be used for good, not evil. Obviously, the problem with this is it leaves um, uh, the, the interpretation of good and evil to the courts, uh, which is you know, a legal nightmare that no one really wants to get in. And so basically, uh, Crockford talks about this in a really nice video where he's basically saying he's getting calls on a regular basis from um, uh, uh, attorneys at different um, uh, tech firms uh, that, ask, that ask him to um, uh, you know, make, uh, change the license or actually make... Uh, Expect, uh, exceptions for like their particular use case. The video is online, it's really funny. He actually, he's, he's a really funny speaker, so it's, it's well worth having a look at it. I have the links in the slides. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the second one is uh, the Hippocratic uh, license by um, uh, Caroline. I have to actually check uh, her last. Yes, um, um, Caroline Ada Emke. I, I didn't want to um, mispronounce her, her last name. Um, and um, so it, it does a bunch of uh, things that, in my um, opinion, are really right and a, really, a real progress on the existing situation. First of all, it actually solves the problem of defining evil by basically relying on human rights, which is just you know, a well understood body of law that's been ratified in a bunch of countries, that's like, uh, you know, that's been used quite a bit and doesn't have like sort of the definition problems. Um, and it also doesn't conflict with the criteria five and six of the open source definition by really narrowing down um, um, what actually is not permitted and, and making it like specific to actions and not people, groups, or field of endeavor, right? And my argument is like genocide is not a field of endeavor, uh, which I think like, you know, everyone should pretty much agree with this. Um, the problem, though, is that it leaves the definition of human rights violation to the courts, which obviously is a problem when it's a government that's actually making the human rights violation, right? If it's also the government's courts that are making that decision. So, so that's like sort of, you know, not really enough. Um, and the other part, which I think is actually a deeper problem, is it doesn't have a, a good, strong adoption story. Um, and so, you know, if we look at actually what's missing, well, one of it is the reliance on an internationally recognized and respected body that defines actual violations of human rights, right? There are such uh, um, 
uh, bodies in Geneva. Uh, the problem is they're kind of staffed with uh, representatives of countries that have a terrible, terrible track record with uh, human rights violation. So, you know, that, that's sort of a problem that still needs to be solved. Um, and then, like, what's really missing is community buy-in and multi-stakeholder support. So, the idea here is that, you know, if you want to change the way um, uh, licensing uh, is done, you can't just do that on your side. You have to engage with the community, get maintainers on board, get projects on board, get nonprofits like the OSI, the Apache Foundation, et cetera, on board, and also get corporations on board. Um, the third thing that's missing is a clear path from existing licenses to uh, ethical ones. Because again, like having, an, you know, having the, uh, the option of ethical licenses on the side um, is good, but making sure that the industry moves together towards a more ethical future is much better. So you need actual tooling, you need uh, you know, uh, to figure out the legal aspects, you need education around these issues to actually make this transformation. Right? And the fourth point is that as a community we need a mindset shift to redefine uh, the norm of how we build open source as being respectful of human rights. And it's not just the idea of um, basically allowing a few projects to have such licenses, it's reconsidering how we work. And so it's really, to me, what's important is that, that mindset shift between this is a, uh, you know, a fringe uh, issue that a few people care about to this is the norm of how open source software is built. So I mentioned corporations and corporation approval, and I'm sure a lot of you were like, you know, what the fuck, why? Like, why do we care? Why is this important? Um, and, well, the truth is, if corporations can't use the licenses of open source, they're just never going to get traction, right? Um, and the other interesting aspect to me is that uh, a lot of corporations are in somewhat of a prisoner's dilemma here um, in which they would gladly stop having to actually provide software to uh, particular organizations, uh, you know, government organizations so they're doing something really evil. But if they do that, they risk losing like the rest of the contracts that the government does, right? And so providing them was sort of like a get out of jail card, a joker, right? Where they can say, well, we'd love to be able to give you that too, but we're not allowed to, um, is actually something that, could, um, that they might really welcome. Um, so quickly, what do we actually hope to get out of this? Uh, well, four things. First is putting human rights back at the heart of open source and software development. Um, the second thing is uh, human rights trained IP lawyers and corporations, which you know would be a great thing. Um, give a corporations an excuse to reject certain projects um, and potentially actually reduce the pool of available software for human rights violation. Um, there's been a lot of critiques of this. I'm going to go through five of them really quickly. Um, one of them is there are other better ways of doing this. Uh, I'm sure. Why don't we try all of these different ways at the same time? Right? Doesn't, you know, can't hurt. Uh, the second one is there's a risk of ethical license proliferation, and we see this already, right? Um, and frankly, if we actually built this notion into open source itself, that would actually reduce the risk of proliferation, not increase it. Um, third and fourth that often come up together, which is kind of funny, is that's going to be a compliance nightmare, or it's not enforceable, so not worth it, which is it's one or the other, right? I mean, it's either going to be a compliance nightmare, or it's not, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and as such, it would not be enforceable, right? Um, uh, or, I mean, it, it, like, it doesn't make sense to have these two things together. My belief is, um, from a compliance perspective, um, if it's actually channeled to like, human rights only and not like a gazillion other things, um, it's actually rather simple. And this could actually help against proliferation of other issues. You know, it's like the slippery slope argument. Uh, well, if we do, if we allow like, human rights, what about like, you know, uh, pro-life, forbid use was like abortion? And there's a really good answer to this, which is um, get it into the human rights, right? If it's if like you know you know if like it's white supremacy that you want to like you know is that your thing? 
well, make sure that you get that into human rights and you're going to get by default in every other license. Right? So it like, really scopes uh, the actual uh, sort of like ethical boundary to a, a body of law that's really well accepted worldwide. Um, and the last bit is it's in violation of um, the open source definition and the four freedoms. I actually think that um, um, it, it's, it's possible to do this with, uh, within the bounds of the open source definition. It would clearly be in violation of the first freedom of the, force, uh, of the four freedoms. Um, and um, I actually think that that is an accept acceptable trade-off and we can actually change those as a community to reflect the norms that we have today. Um, and I think, oh, two minutes. Uh, so, uh, well, next steps. Uh, this is a huge multi-year effort. Um, and like the idea here is to kickstart uh, this conversation um, and to see if this interest um, and, and then to start discussing, well, how exactly would we go about this? Uh, is an existing organization like OSI ready to take the lead on something like this? Um, would this need like a different organization to step up? Um, basically, like, is there interest from maintainers? Uh, is there interest from corporations? Uh, let, let's basically start a conversation about this and see if, as a community, we can move towards um, uh, considering um, ethics, uh, you know, as as a, a sort of uh, fundamental part of software. And uh, with this, I will uh, yield the floor and take questions outside. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Toby. We really appreciate it.